Hello everyone, welcome to my very messy studio. My name is Mark Kompanietz and I'm a professional artist, an art professor, and a YouTube personality. In this video we're going to be looking at five very popular inexpensive pens from an artist's perspective. While I think that every artist should try drawing with a fountain pen, I'm also aware that many of the pens I review on my channel are ridiculously expensive, especially for those living on an artist's income. Case in point is this Pilot 743FA, a pen that retails at around 250 bucks. This pen is an exquisite, fine-tuned instrument, and if it's within your budget, by all means don't hesitate to get it. But what options do you have if the price of this pen is half your rent and completely out of reach? Fortunately, there are plenty of well-known, well-functioning pens for $30 and under, such as this Pilot Metropolitan. You also have the Lamy Safari and the Kaweco Sport. And in recent years, we've seen a dizzying variety of other high-quality, affordable pens enter the market. For example, the Twisby Eco, which is one of my favorite pens in any price range, which sells for around $30, uses high-quality Yovo nib, and also has a piston-filling mechanism, a feature usually reserved for far more expensive pens. Unfortunately, there's also a lot of junk out there with terrible design flaws and so many manufacturing shortcuts that they break in their first use if they work at all. This is why I've sworn off buying cheap pens altogether, preferring to save up until I can afford something a little nicer. The problem is, I'm often asked for inexpensive pen recommendations, so I feel obligated to keep a lookout for pens to recommend. And since I would never recommend a pen that I haven't thoroughly tested, I've decided to break with my policy a little, buy a few inexpensive pens that have been receiving positive reviews, and actually try them. And in order to assuage the guilt for breaking my solemn oath to stop buying cheapo pens, I plan to give all of these away to my students. Unless of course the pen happens to be very good, in which case, guilt or no guilt, I'm keeping it. Okay, the first pen I'm going to show you is the Hong Dian Black Forest, which you can find for around $15. Let's go take a look at it. The Hong Dian Black Forest is a sturdy all-aluminum pen with a substantial feel to it. That makes it perfect for taking outdoors into messy studios and other environments where you might not want to take your more expensive pens. In this respect, it's in the same category as this Koweco Sport AL. This is a pen that I'm not afraid to drop or throw into my bag or place into my pocket. It features a snap cap, a feature which on many pens feels rather flimsy, but on this pen feels very sec secure with a satisfying snap. This is a pen that you can cap and uncap quickly, which makes it great for note taking and quick sketching. The ergonomics of this pen are pretty decent. The section is quite slender, but not uncomfortable, and the balance of the pen is very good when unposted. I also like that the pen body is relatively slender, so you can comfortably grip the pen on the barrel, as I often do when drawing. The pen comes with a large converter, which allows you to use it with bottled inks, something I prefer. And the build of the converter is pretty nice, fitting very snugly into the grip section. The build quality of this pen for the price point is excellent, with precisely machined threading in the barrel, no shaky parts, and a clip with just the right amount of spring to it. And this is a nice looking pen, with a tasteful industrial looking design, with a few flourishes like a glossy finial, and some subtle bands across the cap, and also a very pretty knurling on the body. I like the black satin finish, though perhaps extending it all the way to the nib is a little bit silly. There are a few problems here. The pen posts very securely, but very shallowly, making the pen so back heavy and long that it's unusable. And while the section is comfortable, the step to the barrel here is very sharp, and I find that it starts to dig uncomfortably into my fingers during long drawing sessions. Also, and this is a slightly bigger issue, the pen uses a proprietary converter and cartridges. I don't mind the proprietary converter, but using proprietary cartridges will limit your ink selection. So the solution here is to empty a cartridge and refill it using a syringe. Okay, now that we've covered the pros and cons of the pen body, let's get down to the most important aspect, nib performance. In my recent review of the Koweco Sport with a steel semi-flex nib, I introduced a four-part test that is mostly relevant to flex nibs. Since none of the pens I'm going to review here qualify as flexible, I've had to revise the tests, so here's my four-part test that going forward I'll be using for non-flexible pens. The first test is hatching at different speeds and lengths to check for skipping. I use a lot of hatching in my work, so for me this is a very important test. But it's also relevant for artists that don't hatch because we tend to use a large variety of marks at different speeds and directions, and it's good to know that a pen will work reliably and does not skip. 
The Hong Dian has a fairly consistent nib, putting down a juicy fine line that's similar to a Yovo fine nib. And while it will occasionally skip, it does so so infrequently that I suspect that it's probably my inconsistent hash technique rather than an inconsistent nib. The second test is for line variation. Even though this test is designed for non-flex pens, most fountain pens are capable of producing some degree of line variation anyway. The most common way to change the line weight is through changes in pressure, but there are other ways. For instance, some pens, when held at an angle, will produce a very, very thin line. There's also something called reverse writing, where you hold the pen upside down, something I also find very useful. In the line variation test, the Hong Dian showed itself to have a touch of flexibility, going from fine to medium with some pressure. At an angle, it did put down a much thinner line, but inconsistently, so that this pen cannot be used this way. Fortunately, it turned out to be a decent reverse writer, putting down an extra fine line. Here's the flex cube to demonstrate how the line variation works in practice. This is a slightly flexible nib, running on my 1 through 10 scale at about a 2, with a 0 being a nail, like a platinum preppy with no flex, and a 3 starting to push into the soft category. For those that have pens that use Yovo nibs, the flexibility is actually quite comparable. The third test is for smoothness, also called feedback in the fountain pen community, and also wetness. These are two separate things, of course, but related to each other, since a pen with more ample flow will generally write smoother due to the lubricating nature of the ink. The Hong Dian has a pleasant amount of feedback, nothing terribly smooth, but definitely not scratchy, very similar to a number 5 Yovo nib. This will be a very pleasant nib for those that like a touch of feedback. Okay, here's the test for wetness. This pen turned out to be a touch of a gusher, being considerably wetter than all of the other pens I tested today. This might be a problem if you're using a hatch-heavy style, but so long as you build up the drawing slowly and don't rush the layering, you'll be fine. The fourth test I'm going to do is to draw with a pen for an extended period. It's one thing to do a bunch of quick hatching, or put down a bunch of lines in different thicknesses, or even to draw a cube. It's another thing entirely to really put the pen through its paces and see how it performs in a longer drawing. To begin with, this is supposed to be an extra fine nib, but it writes more like a fine, and because of its wetness, even pushes towards fine medium. I generally prefer extra fine nibs, so this is a bit of a problem. However, this pen is a very reliable reverse writer, so I can get that extra fine line if I need it. Despite this being a heavier pen, it still feels quite nibble in the hand, and you quickly get used to the weight. The grip section is a little bit too slick and thin for comfort, however, and I wish that attractive knurling that is all over the body extended to the grip section. As I mentioned, the sharp step up on the barrel really got annoying after a while, digging into my fingers. I would say that this is the biggest drawback to this pen. For occasional writing, it's fine, but if you plan on using this pen for extended drawing sessions, that step up is a big issue. The wetness is also an issue if you plan to use heavy hatching. Here I'm using fairly decent multimedia paper, but if I was working on regular drawing paper, the wetness would have been a problem, with the ink feathering and even striking through to the other side. So, do I recommend this pen, despite those reservations? Yes, considering the price, this pen is an excellent option for those looking for a functional practical pen that will stand up to rough treatment. But here's a feature that will make this pen a must-buy for many people. This pen uses a number 5 size nib, which means that it can easily be switched out with a large number of other nibs, including one of my all-time favorites, the number 5.5 Ultraflex nib from Fountain Pen Revolution. And, since this pen has a very generous feed, it does a decent job keeping up with the increased ink demands of this ink-hungry nib. This combo of a super sturdy pen body with a superb steel flex nib makes this pen a perfect choice for anyone looking for an ultra cheap flex pen option. Okay, let's move on to another very highly regarded inexpensive pen, the Muji. This is a very sturdy all aluminum pen, this time from Japan. And though it's slightly more slender than the Hong Dian in the barrel, the grip section is thicker, being about the same width as the rest of the pen. While the Hong Dian has knurling on the body of the pen, but not the grip, this one has knurling in the grip section, where it actually serves a practical purpose. This kind of grip is something that I enjoy on my Rotring mechanical pencils, and wish existed on more fountain pens. Like the Hong Dian, this pen posts very securely, with an unusual posting system where the cap slides into the back of the pen. However, while the Hong Dian becomes unusable when posted, the cap of the Muji is very light and doesn't off-balance the pen at all. The overall build quality is perhaps flimsier than the Hong Dian, and the design is less elegant, missing some of the subtle decorative touches. But those not interested in aesthetics, those of you that are looking for a practical studio tool, this is a great utilitarian design. 
this pen actually has a number of design advantages over the Hongdian. While the Hongdian is covered in black lacquer that is susceptible to scratching, this pen is made of raw aluminum and will be even more at home in all kinds of rough and tumble environments. Also, this pen takes international cartridges and converters, which is a giant plus. One, no one note, however, is that Chinese converters don't seem to fit into this pen, so look for converters from European brands. As far as drawbacks, there are very few. Again, this pen has a slightly flimsier feel than the Hongdian. The cap moves slightly and the threads in the barrel are perhaps not as quite finely machined. This is nothing major, since nothing here feels like it'll fall apart. The knurling on the grip section is very pleasant, but could be a little bit toothier. And lastly, and I can't explain why, but there's something slightly unpleasant about the unpolished aluminum texture. Okay, let's take this pen through my patented four-part test. The first of which is speed hatching. This is a number five size nib that puts down a Japanese extra fine line, meaning that it's much finer than its Western equivalents, almost qualifying as an extra fine. The performance here is perfect, with no skipping in any direction, regardless of speed. This kind of performance is not uncommon, since any well-tuned nib will put out a perfect performance like this. But remember that this pen sells for under $15, and for that price point, this kind of reliability is somewhat rare. When it comes to line variation, things get interesting because the nib here has some flex to it, so much that it could almost qualify as a semi-flex. It goes from a very thin, extra extra fine line to a broad, without a terrible amount of pressure. Since this pen is not designed for flex, you have to be careful not to press too much and spring the tines, but again, this is a $15 pen, so if you ruin it, it's not a tragedy. Besides that, it also puts down a reliable extra 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 fine line when held at an oblique angle. This pen is also an excellent reverse writer. In my flex cube test, the flexibility really comes to the fore. I rank this nib at about a 3.5, just short of semi-flex, the same ranking I gave the Pilot Falcon. The nibs of these two pens actually perform very similarly, being equally responsive to pressure. Considering the price difference between them, that's remarkable. Now let's do the tests for wetness and smoothness. This pen is slightly scratchier than the Hongdian, which is not surprising considering that it's much thinner. The feedback is not unpleasant and is consistent regardless of direction or speed, which I think is an important aspect. As for dryness, this pen is very dry, much drier than the Hongdian. Of course, had I flexed it, it would have written wetter, but even then, it generally puts down a drier line than many other pens with flex, including the Falcon. This is a great feature because most flex pens put down a very wet line. That causes problems with drying and feathering. Really exceptional performance here. Okay, let's do a drawing with this pen and see how it works in practice. The first thing that strikes me is the terrific degree of control I get when making a variety of strokes. This pen reliably puts down a very thin line when held at an angle, which, though I didn't do in this drawing, is great for initial sketching. And then the flex is terrific. Not quite the semi-flex that I find ideal, but good for most drawing purposes. The original nib in this pen works so well, however, that there's no reason to switch it out. In short, if you're looking for a cheap, practical pen with some flex to it, this is a fantastic option. It's also a great transitional pen for those artists that consider fountain pens to be grandfatherly luxury items and are put off by their supposed fanciness. This pen's minimalist design with the knurled grip section that looks identical in mechanical pencil will make many artists less hesitant to try it, and once they do, they'll be hooked. While I like the utilitarian, industrial-looking design of these previous two pens, both of them are very slender and don't really look like traditional fountain pens. But what if you're looking for something more substantial, a really good, cheap, and chunky pen? Here is my recommendation, the Jinhao X159, a pen that you can buy for under $10. This quote-unquote tribute to the Mont Blanc 149 is remarkably well made and actually works pretty well. While the previous version of the X159 was all metal, this one is plastic with a few metal parts giving this pen a nice weight somewhat similar to the original 149. While I happen to have a 149 right here that I could compare it to, I think it's a little bit pointless. This pen is a luxury item that new retails for something like $800, while this one is 10 bucks. Other than the similarity in surface appearance, they're different pens entirely, the 149 being a piston filler with a giant gold nib while the Jin Hao is a simple cartridge converter pen with a steel nib. Let's take a closer look at this pen. The overall ergonomics are fantastic with a nice balance in the hand, a chubby comfortable grip section, and smooth threading that doesn't cut into your fingers. This pen posts very securely. 
and retains very good balance when posted, something I appreciate since I enjoy posting my pens. Overall, the build quality and the metal parts give this pen a sturdy feel, and though the plastic here is probably very prone to scratching, so what? This is a budget pen that I wouldn't hesitate to throw into a bag and take absolutely everywhere. This pen, like all Jinhao, takes universal converters and cartridges, which is great since I dislike when companies use proprietary accessories. Unlike the previous versions of the X159, which use a number 6 size nib, this one now uses a jumbo number 8, which looks much more proportional to the chunky pen body. This is purely cosmetic, however, since really the nib performance is completely unrelated to size. We'll talk about this nib in detail in a moment, but first let's talk about the downsides. There's actually very few, considering that this is an ultra-cheap pen. If you want to nitpick, you have metal on plastic threads in the barrel, which in the long term is a recipe for wear and tear, but the threads are accurate and tight, and everything else is nicely done with decent attention to detail. As mentioned, this pen is a cartridge converter, which I tend not to like because of the small ink capacity. However, this is a drawback for pens with flexible nibs that use up a lot of ink. Since this pen writes very dry and fine, I think the ink capacity is really not an issue. The only real drawback is that this number 8 nib, while aesthetically pleasing, is an unusual size, so you're not going to be able to find something you can easily swap it with. A number of manufacturers are starting to make steel number 8 nibs, however, so perhaps there'll be more options in the future. Okay, let's talk about the nib and how the pen actually works, starting with my speed hatching test. Surprisingly, this pen, despite having a big jumbo nib, puts down the finest line, and extra, extra fine. The reliability is pretty good here, with no skipping when making marks in different directions, speeds, and angles. Again, nothing unusual when a nib is well tuned, but at this price point, such reliability is hard to find. As for line variation, this nib also has a touch of flex to it, not as much as the Muji, and requiring a little bit more pressure. Given the fineness of the lines when not flexed, this pen actually produces some pretty impressive line variation, and also puts down an even thinner extra 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 fine line when used at an angle. In reverse writing, it's also fairly good, though quite scratchy, as is expected when the nib is already this fine. I rank this nib at about a 2.5, one point behind the Muji, but considering that its starting point is finer, the range of line variation from extra extra fine to medium is pretty impressive. As for feedback, it's relatively smooth for a pen this fine and this dry. Again, mostly feedback is bothersome when it's inconsistent, when a pen is smooth in one direction but starts to catch in another. Some of you out there have a strong preference when it comes to smoothness, but I really don't. So long as the feedback is consistent, I find that I quickly get used to it and it doesn't play a large part in how I feel about a pen's performance. As for wetness, this pen is very, very dry. A surprising thing considering the size of the nib and feed. By the way, the wetness of the nib can be adjusted by taking the shoulders of the nib and flaring them out, decreasing the pressure on the tines. Let's do a drawing and see how this pen performs. Like the Muji, I find that I have control over a large variety of strokes, but this pen is capable of going much thinner, which is something I like a lot. It feels very easy to control and might be a good entry-level pen for those curious about soft or semi-flex nibs but aren't ready to make the dive into something more expensive. Despite the pen's size, the fineness of the nib and the miserly ink flow contribute to making this pen well suited for precise, miniature work. It makes for an intriguing contrast, a big chunky pen producing thin, precise lines. It takes some getting used to, but I find once you do, it's very comfortable. I've drawn with it for several hours at a time, and I've come to enjoy the thickness of the grip section and the added stability it provides. Furthermore, after a long drawing session, I don't feel any strain on my fingers like I would with a pen with a thinner grip section. But there's something here beyond just simple ergonomics. There's something about the size and balance of this pen that I find very pleasing, and it's very fun to draw with. So, do I recommend this pen? Yes, I do. While perhaps not as practical as the Hongdian or the Muji, I love the feel of it, and to be honest, it's been several weeks since I've started working on this video, and I still find myself reaching for it when I feel like drawing. The last two pens I'm going to show you are made by a company called Moonman, also called Mahjong. This brand has long been on my radar, being very positively reviewed by many pen enthusiasts. And though many of the pens made by Moonman seem to mimic well-known designs, they also create innovative designs of their own. This quite recent release, the P136, has garnered a great deal of positive attention and is essentially a copy of a very well-known Mont Blanc 146. But unlike the Jinhao X159, which despite its positive qualities is still a fairly cheap imitation, the build quality here is excellent. 
Just like the Mont Blanc 146, it has a very smooth built-in piston filling mechanism made with metal parts. It also has a useful ink window. What's more, the plastic it's made from is remarkably similar in feel to the resin used in Mont Blanc pens, down to the red glow that you see when you shine a light through it. The ergonomics of this pen are excellent. For me, this is actually an ideal size, a pen that is a touch on the larger side without being super, super jumbo. The metal parts used in the piston filling mechanism also give it a substantial feel. Many commenters have criticized this pen for not posting well, so I didn't expect it to post, but to my surprise, it actually does. The posting isn't perfect, but you can get it to post securely, and the pen remains well balanced when posted. This pen is not super cheap, usually around $36, but the quality of the build for that price is very, very good. And you have to look really closely at the pen to notice compromises in build quality. Until, unfortunately, you get to the nib. And there, I'm very sad to report, is where it looks like Moonman made all the manufacturing shortcuts, because this nib is awful. Much like the nib on the Jinhao X159, it's an extra fine, but considerably scratchier and with much poorer flow. While it still sort of works, and I was able to draw with it, it's one of the more unpleasant nibs I've used on any pen. Given how nice the pen body is, that is very disappointing. Okay, let's subject this pen to the four tests. This is an extra fine nib, and it's super inconsistent in the hatching test, skipping in just about every direction. By the way, I did look at the nib under a loop, and could not identify any flaws, a baby's bottom or tine misalignment that might be the cause of the problem. It's just a crappy nib all on its own. In the line variation test, it performed like a standard non-flex nib, producing a touch of line variation under pressure. As to be expected, it did not deliver a consistent line when used at an angle, and in reverse writing, it produced a relatively constant extra, extra fine line. I would rate this nib at around a 1. This nib has quite a bit of feedback, and was consistently scratchy in every direction. As for wetness, the nib was dry to the point that I was wondering if there was something blocking the feed. I managed to improve the flow a touch by flaring the shoulders, and this improved things slightly, but still, I don't think I've ever had a pen write this dry. Now for the drawing test. This pen is a huge disappointment because the ergonomics are almost ideal here, and the build quality is quite impressive. I also love that it has a precise piston filling mechanism, and if the nib was better, this could have been a real winner. To add insult to injury, even though this pen uses a number 6 nib, which could potentially be switched out, no matter how I tried, I could not remove the nib and feed from the section, not with a grip and not with pliers. One reviewer I saw was able to remove it with just his hands, and I couldn't. Another reviewer was able to pop it out using a knockout block that looks like this. That seems more plausible and less damaging to the feed and housing unit. Those knockout blocks are fairly inexpensive, and I could get one, but I have no experience with them, and this seems like a tremendous amount of hassle to go through to replace a nib. Furthermore, though the nib on this pen is the number 6 size, it's not a standard nib, and has small cutouts on each side, and a little notch on the back. Given the difficulty of removing the nib from this pen, and the uncertainty that if you do manage to do it, you can successfully replace it with something better, I decided not to bother. Furthermore, the inability to easily pull out the nib and feed present a problem for cleaning the pen thoroughly, since inks have a tendency to build up inside the nib and feed. So, while this drawing is actually my favorite of the ones I did for this pen review, the pen itself is a horrible dud that I strongly recommend you stay away from. Moonman does sell alternative nibs for this pen, and perhaps other sizes work better, but personally I'm not willing to give this lemon a second chance. The other Moonman that I bought, the C1 model, looks similar to the Opus 88 demonstrator I have here, but without the shutoff valve mechanism that makes this pen so great. I really like my Opus 88 demonstrators, but they're expensive, and this one looked like a nice, far cheaper alternative. The build quality, of course, as was expected, is not quite as good. Unlike the Opus 88, which has a double reservoir, this pen, like all simple eyedropper filling pens, has a tendency to burp when ink levels are low. This happens when the air in the reservoir heats up and expands, pushing the ink out of the pen. Now, this can be prevented by always keeping the pen full of ink, but if you have to constantly keep the pen full, that sort of negates the whole point of having a giant ink capacity. Still, considering this pen is about $23, I think the risk of burping is a small price to pay. Other than that, there are a few additional, mostly irksome issues. The threads in the cap, for example, are not quite as precise, and the flat facet that we have here, that's supposed to act like a roll stop, doesn't as a result. 
This is a small but annoying detail because it prevents the pen from laying flat and therefore from not rolling away. In terms of ergonomics, this pen is decent, a good size and weight. It doesn't post, but these kinds of designs almost never do. There is a little step up from the grip section to the body, which I find a little bit irritating because it kind of digs into my fingers and prevents me from fluidly moving them up and down as I draw. This pen has a lot to recommend it. It uses the same high quality acrylic as the Opus 88, is a good size and weight, and even has an attractive colorful acrylic grip section. Like all eye drop fillers, it has a really large ink capacity, and the ability to see the ink and how much you have is really useful for artists. Plus, the ink looks really neat sloshing around like this. But sadly, just like the Moonman P136, the nib on this pen is a complete dud. Scratchy, dry, and inconsistent. This is an extra fine number six size nib, which is slightly different than the one on the P136, being a little bit more consistent. I definitely found it worked better in some directions, but surprisingly performed the worst on the downward stroke, a direction where fountain pens are usually most at home. The line variation was also a touch better than the P136, and the thin lines produced by holding the pen at an angle were more consistent. It was also a more reliable pen in reverse writing, producing an extra, extra, extra fine line. I would rank this nib a little flexier than the P136 at about a 1.5, similar to what can be produced by a number 6 Yovo nib. In terms of feedback, it was just as scratchy as the P136 and also equally dry. I managed to improve the flow a bit by flaring the nib shoulders, but I think the issue here is the same as in the P136, a feed that just doesn't provide adequate flow. Like the Moonman P136, this pen is a giant disappointment. The nib, while performing better than the P136 in the first three tests, performed worse in the drawing test, being super scratchy, dry, and inconsistent. This is one of the few times I wanted to rush through the drawing and get it over with. While the P136 was at least pleasant to hold because of its excellent ergonomics, this one annoyed me because of the sharp step up from the grip section to the barrel. This pen had so much potential to be great that it was a letdown that it fell so short. Really, this kind of pen design is ideal for artists, allowing you to instantly see the kind of ink being used and whether there's enough of it. Eyedropper filling systems are also very practical, giving you good ink capacity and being a cinch to clean. Having a much cheaper alternative to the Opus 88 would have been great, but the nib in these pens ruined those plans. And once again, just like in the P136, I could not remove the nib and feed from the housing. This again is a terrible shame since it's a number 6 nice nib that could be replaced with tons of better options. As it stands, the performance of the nib is so poor that it actually ruined my drawing. So unfortunately, this pen, which had so much potential to be great, is not recommended. So, to summarize my review, I think the Hongdian is a good pen with excellent build quality and a very decent wet writing nib, and the fact that you can fit it with a 5.5 Ultraflex nib from Fountain Pen Revolution makes it highly, highly recommended. The Muji pen is also highly recommended, with the best performing nib of the pens reviewed here. For those long used to working with fountain pens, the ergonomics and looks of the pen will be questionable. But for those used to working with narrower pens or mechanical pencils, especially people that are new to fountain pens, this is a great transitional pen. The Jinhao X159 is also recommended. Jinhao is really an amazing company that has introduced many people to the world of fountain pens through their well-made budget options, and this is no exception. The chubby ergonomics of this pen, combined with the well-performing nib, makes this a terrific option. In fact, out of all the pens in this review, this is the pen I keep coming back to. It's a silly reason to recommend a drawing tool, but for some reason, it's super fun to draw with. These two Moonmans, on the other hand, are to my deep disappointment, complete and total duds. I really wanted to like them and look forward to trying other pens made by what looked like an exciting and innovative brand. But given the terrible performance of these two nibs and my inability to switch them out with something better, I don't think I'll be buying any more of them. So now that I've done this review, has my mind been changed about purchasing cheaper pens? Look, I was a starving artist once, and in fact, I probably still qualify. So if a more expensive pen is not within your budget, then by all means, get something inexpensive. And in fact, I think this Muji pen actually qualifies as one of the better pens for any price range. It has a flexible nib, it's got decent ergonomics, it's sturdy. Um, this is a really decent purchase. But if you can save up a little bit, I would still get the Twisby Eco. It has a piston filling mechanism with larger ink capacity. It's a demonstrator so you can see through it. And it has a really high quality Yovo nib with a little bit of flexibility. Not quite the same as the Muji, but 
really good enough. And then if you have a little bit more money, so we're running at around $50, I recommend getting one of these. This is a Narwhal demonstrator pen. This is a special edition. But uh, the fully clear one runs for about $50. It has a really, again, a nice filling, uh, piston filling mechanism. Um, it has a really decent nib that you can switch out for lots of other number six options. Or this one. Uh, this is the Pen BBS 456, which again has a really decent number size nib that can also be switched out. Uh, and it has a vacuum filling mechanism with really nice ink capacity as well. Look, the main issue as I see it with those cheaper pens really isn't about whether they write or not. Uh, it doesn't take that much for a pen to write. Uh, most of them do. Uh, some of them, like we saw the Moon Man, didn't at all or really poorly, but most of them work. The question is longevity, right? How long will the pen last? Um, guys, you, you don't know how many cheaper pens I have that are broken, that I haven't thrown away, that have leaked on me. Um, this is really the main reason why I stopped buying them, right? Uh, they might work for a while, but then they just break on you and then leak everywhere. So uh, my advice on buying cheaper pens stands. Uh, again, if you have the budget, go for it. But uh, my advice is to save a little bit, buy fewer pens, definitely, and just save enough money until you can buy something nicer. That's my advice. All right, guys, thanks for watching. Thanks for tolerating my messy studio. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, leave them below, and I'll be happy to reply. Bye for now.